The 25th Psalm is the text for the morning. I do not intend to make careful exposition, but simply let our minds play over the psalm previously. And if I were to pick a text out, maybe it might be the 21st. Let integrity, uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Now, we have a little section of a great spiritual biography where the man David is writing himself into this. He is, he is telling us about himself and his relation to God and the world. And we see and hear in this 25th Psalm a living man engaged in the business of living. We see here a good man living in a bad world, a right man living in a wrong world. And naturally, there it's not a smooth song. My brethren, nothing smooth if it is realistic, fair reflection of life. Lord Jesus Christ was not a smooth life. He had great inward ability, for he knew he was in the bosom of the Father, and he knew that not even his incarnation took him out of the bosom of the Father. For he knew that the persons of the Godhead are indivisible. You cannot divide the Son from the Father by incarnation or by crucifixion or by death. He knew that he could never be separated from the Father's heart. Though as a man among men, he lived his turbulent life his life surrounded by enemies. So that I think it fair to say that if you're living too smooth a life, you may well question being in the will of God or not. David served his generation by the will of God before he fell on sleep. He was a man after God's own heart. So I think it fair to take him for an example. And David did not live a tranquil life. He had periods of tranquility. He had uh, times put away like a lark and sang at heaven's gate. But uh, he soon found himself down on the earth again, back in the turbulent and disturbed world where he had to live. Now, we do not find here, in much modern religion, a man in a classroom learning and uh, analyzing. We have, uh, we have taken on the classroom psychology too much in Christian religion in these days. Classrooms are necessary, not intended to be any uh, a reflection upon the classroom. It is only to say that the classroom is an situation. It is something apart from the stream of life, hoping that it will teach those who are in that classroom when into the stream of life to live better more wisely. But it is for, uh, in, for the moment not a part of life really, the ivory tower of life. When Christianity is never to be understood, the faith of our Father thought of from the classroom. It is not someone looking over heavy glasses, telling them the facts of Christianity or using a chart to illustrate. But the faith of our fathers, of the plain people, the faith of men living in the world, the faith of our fathers is the marketplace where men argue and debate and cheat. The man of God won't cheat, cheat. The faith of our fathers uh, is, is geared to the kitchen and the home where I uh, answers the phone and uh, the doorbell a dozen times of a morning and the baby suddenly runs a temperature out of town and 
She's in distress. And then the doorbell rings again. And then the phone, and it's her wrong number. It's her life. She's got to have something that'll go down there. Your classroom can't help her there. Nothing abstract can do her any good there. The faith of our fathers has to get into the kitchen, into the home, into the nursery, into the base, and where people are engaged in the downright tough business of living right in a wrong world. The fear has to get in to the cab of the truck as it bowls down the highway, around the curves till the arms ache, out on the long straightaway stretches until the monotony puts us to sleep. And uh, trouble every three horns honking from the rear, and uh, blowouts and difficulties. And no classroom theory there, no ivory tower there. Christianity has to get into that cab and behind that wheel and into the heart and so that he can do that like a Christian and drive his big truck like a Christian. The faith of our fathers has to get into the machine, the smell of hot oil and dirty gloves and dirty overalls and cursing men and hard customers. And it's got to be there and it's got to prove itself there and live right there and be right there. The fifth psalm is an illustration of all this. A man in the midst of life. A good man living in a bad world and living in a wrong world. God's man living in the devil's world. And he has to come through that and has to and suffer it out and come out all right. And that's why I like the Bible. It's a book of a high philosophy and lofty theology and brilliant metaphysics. But it's as practical as your shoes you wear a bedroom slipper right down where you live. You can get into it, and it doesn't fail you. And you don't have to know a million things, and you don't have a tale of culture, nor study from Emily Post where to put your spoon. Plain people that don't know what to do with a spoon. Imagine that he went to a banquet that was so ritzy that it was 1 o'clock in the morning, for it was through, and he found 1 o'clock in the morning a tablespoon. He'd evidently uh, used up the wrong one at the wrong place, and the snooty waiter wouldn't take it away. So there, at one o'clock, and they were through eating, and he had him just a tablespoon lying by his plate. Well, that would chagrin some people and drive them to suicide. But the place in this bad world, trying to live right with God, isn't so much worried because he knows that Christianity meets all situa situations, political situations, industrial situations. So well, here was the man David engaged in living and living in a bad world. It was H.G. Wells, you know, who said that Buddhism was the best, but that it wouldn't thrive except in a warm climate. Christianity will thrive in any climate at all. Just let the Christ get in, and whether he is living in an igloo hut somewhere in the far Arctic, or whether he's living with but a G-string on somewhere in Africa, if he's a true, sincere man, whether it's his grass or no igloo, Christianity will work. It'll work in the mountains, and it'll work on the plain, and it'll work in the midst of the grave, and never see real sunshine for the smoke and the fumes. The faith of our fathers will work anywhere. H.G. Wells didn't mean to be funny, but it was a humorous thing to say that God Almighty should give the world a religion that will only climb it. If that was true, and that might be true of Buddhism, then what would we do in cold weather? Our spirituality would rise. Every morning you'd have to go out on the porch and say to your wife, I wonder how spiritual I can be today. And if it's a little too cold, you're a sinner this day. I can't live for God today because it's too cold. Christianity's found everywhere. And it's found in... You know, we've had some errors in the church, and one of them has been, of course, to make Christianity consist of my own. Now, I'm a theological dogmatist, and uh, I believe in theology. I believe in the faith of our fathers, and I can put it down, and I could could write a book of discipline if I were forced to do it, telling what I believe and what people ought to believe. And I believe in doctrine. But uh, what, what good is it going to do you to know 
that the Trinity is persons or that there are three persons in the Trinity is a better way of expressing it. If you don't live pleasing to the Trinity, I borrowed that from an old city ago, what does it profit thee to be able to discourse learnedly about the Trinity if thou livest such a life pleasing to the Trinity? What difference does it make that you know that God made the heaven and the earth if you live an ungodly life? doesn't mean anything till it gets inside you, until it seeps by osmosis into the bloodstream of your life, leaves your soul and gets into your bloodstream and gets out into the cells of your spirit and changes you. Any doctor a man has never reached that man. And too often we have a Christianity that consists merely of a lot of creeds that are believed. That's not Christianity. That is only the raw material of Christianity. Until the fire of the hope on that raw material, or changing the figure until that's but the food, that is but the, the, the meat of Christianity. That meat enters the soul of a man by faith and repentance. It can't do the man any good. Objective Christianity is not the Christian. The faith of our fathers is objective truth, having become subjective reality within the soul by penitent prayer. As old John Ruskin, the famous critic, art critic, and philosopher, who a century ago or so wrote very eloquently about the error of calling this a church service because I know what I mean by the word. But he says, watch that we don't get, that we're not mistaken about it. He said, we, we meet together and sit and listen to moral or spiritual truth being expounded and go home and say we have been to a service. That's not necessarily true, for service is more than singing hymns and going home again. Service is living, serving your generation. And living like a Christian after the church doors are locked and the janitor's asleep. And for Christ, between Sunday night and Sunday morning, all the week long, as well as on Sunday. That's right, though I do not follow him in throwing out the word church service as a result. It can be a service. We can with giving our money to a service. We can by expounding the scriptures do a service. We can by singing hymns do a service. But the danger is that it's possible, kind of service, aloof and in a vacuum, altogether unrelated to the rest of our lives. That's where the danger lies. I agree with Ruskin there. So let's watch it. If your Christianity, your Christian faith does not affect every part of being, you have a reason to wonder whether you have the faith of our fathers really in your heart or not. Now look at David. David here was a man in the midst of life. Here he was, surrounded by, look at them, verse 2 to 19, enemies, verse 9, verse 18, affliction, verse 17, troubles, verse 18, pain, verse uh, 17, distress, verse 16, and uh, perplexities all the way through, and sin mentioned three or four times. Now there was a man, no every time, no monk sitting on top of a high pole, letting somebody else feed him. No hermit hidden away in a cave going for a walk at sundown when the birds were singing. No impractical dreamer, but a man who lived in the midst of all these that were surrounding him. Verses 2 and 19 talk about his enemies. Now I might say that a man is known by his friends, generally understood, but the opposite is also true. A man is known by his enemies. No man salt but will have enemies. If he does not have enemies, then he's not doing anything. If he have enemies. If he does anything, he will have a hundred kibitzers telling him that he could have done it better if he had way. And then we say, what have you done? And he answers, well, nothing, but I've been observing. He hasn't done a thing watching somebody else. You'll have kibitzers, fault finders, critics, and enemies, and opposers, and ill-wishers are what you do if you do something. The way to have no enemies is to have no convictions and do nothing at all. Without a conviction, there's only one enemy, and that's God. The conviction is bound to have enemies, and you will now be known by your enemies. You should never worry if you get an enemy. 
would be very concerned with what kind of an enemy that is. If I knew that a communist lived down on Longwood Drive, two doors, there are any down that Republican territory, but uh, if I knew there was a communist living down there, it could turn out to be my enemy, I'd thank God to have a communist for my enemy. But if he's a good man and Putin is my enemy, I ought to be distressed about that. If you have the wrong kind of enemies, woe we'll be to you. But if you have enemies, blessed art thou, for so the prophets fared before thee. And I might digress, as the preachers call it, from my sermon, young people, watch out who your pals are. You may never have done anything wrong, and nobody has, could be able to charge you with having done anything wrong. But if you fall in with and make pals of those who are borderline delinquents, you'll be blamed for being a delinquent too, and you'll have a hard proving you're not. If I don't know who you are, your name is John Doe, Jr. I said, Pastor, do you know young John Doe, Jr., 16 years old? And I said, I don't think I know John Doe. Well, he comes to our church sometimes, attends Sunday school class, plays baseball Tuesday nights during the summer. Well, what about John Doe, Jr.? What kind of fella is he? Well, I, I can't tell you I don't want to commit myself, but I'll tell you who his friends are. And then he names some cigarette suck, dirty tongue, borderline hoodlums, and says he runs around with them. I've got my opinion of John Doe. I haven't been anybody tell me anything. Somebody says that's guilt by association. Sure, it's guilt by association. The headed egghead, whoever said we shouldn't be able to attribute guilt by association, ought to go somewhere and have his head examined. Birds of a feather flock together, and the bird that flocks with buzzards is bound to be a buzzard one. And if I see a wry-necked creature flocking with buzzards, and I go along on that creature, what's he done? You can't prove anything on him. You haven't got a bit of proof he's done anything wrong. No, I have never seen him, wrong, but I know his crowd. So watch it, dear young people. You say, how can I win them? where they are? Did you ever hear of a fella going to hell to win a man who wouldn't go to heaven? No, there's a place to stop. You can win them, but you don't have to win them by running with them. And if you run with them, they, you will not win them. They'll win you. And if we had all the young people in this church now, that have come to make some kind of Christian, or at least been interested over the last 25 years, and then who've been lost to us through bad friendships, we couldn't come. They'd fill every room in the building. They're gone, as they do from all churches, because they get into wrong friendship. But that really is not part of the sermon. This man was surrounded by enemies. And uh, he was surrounded by a hatredly thing. I don't like the word hatred. There it is, verse 19, bitter hatred. And uh, always remember sin hates Always remember that. And the better you are, the more sin will hate you. And then affliction. Now that's verse 8 and verse 18. Now Job's experience interprets the word affliction here. In James we have it. Uh, if any man's afflicted, let him pray. That doesn't mean sick. That means trouble like Job was. He may be sick, but that's only a part of his affliction. You can get afflicted without being sick, and you can be sick without really... Because affliction means uh, or loss or bereavement or uh, having to comfort you. That was the kind of trouble Job had. He had a sickness, too, temporarily, but uh, that was affliction. Job had it. And here it was. And you say, will faith operate? Is the faith of our fathers good? At a time when we, time when there's hatred, a time when there's affliction, the answer is yes. Here was a man living in the middle of it, triumphant. And there's troubles. Verse 17. I don't know all the troubles. And a man that isn't isn't significant enough in God to let him have troubles is too insignificant for God to find. 
If you're significant, if you signify, if you mean anything in the world, you have troubles, all right. Paul's experience shows that. Read 2 Corinthians and see what a time of it Paul had. Poor old Paul. His brethren and his enemies and the Jews and the Gentiles and everybody was after him. In verse 18, you know what I'd like to be able to do? I wish I could stand here and say, Believe on Jesus Christ, Christians should, and thou shalt be free from pain. I wish I could do that. But I can't do that, as so are we in this world. And as my Father has sent me, so send I you. In one sense, Jesus is living over again his life in each one of us. And he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with pain. And he knew it. Now you might as well brace yourself for it. You're going to suffer some pain in your lifetime. And there isn't a human body yet found that was convenient for pain to lodge. Wherever you're hurt, you wish it was somewhere else. And you say, that's an inconvenient place. If I could stand it, if it was somewhere else. And then if it got to the other place, you'd want it somewhere else. There's no place where you can pain conveniently. Pain is always a, a rude, uncouth, barbarian, distic uh, thing. And it, it'll come all right. You can figure on it. It was Shakespeare that's a philosopher when he has a toothache. It's all right to sit back in our ivory tower and philosophize about the heaven and earth and the things that... But when you get a toothache, you don't have so much success in your ivory tower. But Christianity is good where there is pain. Oh, the pain of the people of God down the years. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read any good biography. If it's not true that the people of God have known pain. And our Lord said, oh, so tenderly to his son, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He didn't say, pray to me and I'll deliver you from your suffering. He said, fear things which thou canst suffer. Always remember you can, you can suffer. You can. When the human organism won't take it any, but you can suffer. So brace yourself and thank God for the privilege of feeling a little bit of the sting and the gall and the bitterness that our Lord felt when he was on earth. David had it. Verse 18 talked about pain. Verse 17 talked about distress. Now, distress, of course, is pain, mental and physical, mainly uh, uh, psychological or mental. How distressing mental pain is. It's more distressing than physical pain. I think it can be proved that rarely does it happen that a man commits suicide because of physical pain. Almost always it's because of mental distress. And then there's desolation, verse 16. Desolation, the grief of lonely. I saw a picture in the newspaper here, I think, yesterday, of a man being held back by a policeman. And I'll never, I think, for many a long month, forget that face. Five of these children were just burning to death in the building. A point where no living organism could exist a second in that awful furnace. And this man was going to rush in there and try to rescue, and they were holding him in that face. I'll never forget it, I think. Brother, when he... Fire was out in the act, and that man sat alone. You know what desolation meant. Some of you had a husband in the house and left you. Poor thing. The worst part about it was when he went, he took part. He took the part that lives and vibrates. He took your heart with him. And you scold yourself for it like the mother whose son has been nothing but a rascal from the time he was ten years old, a scoundrel. He's in prison. She can't help it. Her mind doesn't function. It's her, it's her emotions, her nerves, her... She loves that no-good boy of hers until she's in prison. When they walk lockstep, she's walking. The clank of the door, door goes shut and the great iron key turns. It's turned on her. And when he wears the, she wears the prison dress, she can't help it. Her heart has been so tied up with that no good. I don't know I should use the word no good. Jesus died for him. 
And so if Jesus died for me, he's worth praying for, and maybe we'll be saved. But anyway, love is that boy. So some of you have had that happen to you, and you've been desolate. I've had him come to me like that, a sick, white, gray face, and tell me in voice that was not a normal voice that everything was gone. That the one I, the one only thing to me in the world is forsaken. And I've had men come to me and sit, embarrassed, and twist their gloves in their hands and tell me about the wife that walked out. Poor guy, if he could... He could do something, he'd clip, if he had a pair of scissors, he would clip the umbilical cord and cut himself loose, but he can't. He can't, he sees the voice and remembers the little things, he can't. And so he, he has a desolation. Desolation requires loneliness. Then there are perplexities and the uncertainties and the confusion and the, that we're not pleasing God, all this, and then sin. David said here four times, I think, that he about sin, and he prayed to deliver him from his sin. He said, Oh God, don't remember my boyhood, my youth, when I was wild and did these things, sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember me, O oh God, for thy goodness. His sin bothered him. David knew what every instructed person ought to know. That the only real enemy in the land, that's the only real enemy. As long as you can lock the door on sin and lock it out, you haven't an enemy in hell or earth. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It's only sin that's your And when sin gives the key to the enemy, and in comes the invader and takes over, and then there's distress and heartache and grief and sorrow and loss of communion and loss of fruit and loss of joy. As this, let's be sure there's no sin any place. Because sin weakened David and almost is here in this psalm and gave to his enemies their only real power. Because I repeat, the only real danger is with if you keep anything outside, you're all right. As soon as it gets inside, trouble starts. To destroy the enemy within. The only enemy really that he had. Really. Sin. So he prayed and he confessed and he trusted God and he pleaded and he forced it on God. And he made God listen. And he didn't grab at every hope that everything was all right. He insisted on knowing to deliver him completely, so David began to hope in God. Verse 6, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses. I read a passage in a version, I forgot what version it was. I have just rearranged my book, books up here, and I have transferred across a bookcase and leaped down over the other side, four or five of them, and I don't always remember which translation it was. One of them said, O God, thou art loyal to me. And immediately I got on my knees and thanked God. God's loyal to his people. The, the, the loyalty of love and the loyalty of wisdom. David knew it. And so David trusted God and said, Lord, you're loyal and your faithfulness and your tender mercies has, have been ever of old. Praise the Lord. Verse 9. The meek he will guide in judgment. The meek he will teach his way. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord's with them that fear him. 15. He shall pluck my feet out of the net. That's one thing we didn't remember. A net, a booby trap. Booby traps for David. And David said, I can't see the booby traps. I don't, I don't know where they are. And you know how David, he escaped them by not looking for them at all. He escaped them by looking to the Lord. And Lord, the Lord plucked his feet out of the net. And he didn't get into any booby traps. A lot of you dear people, you're developing a soul. You're always afraid. People are always calling me or writing me or coming to see me, and there's always some little old pimple on and they forget all about the cancer in the soul. But some little old thing, afraid of some booby trap. Can I do this? May I should do about this? Think I ought to take in a grand... What do you think about the opera, Mr. Tozer? What do you think about television? What do you think, Mr. Tozer, about... Don't bother me about such things. Those aren't the things that matter, sir. 
There's something bigger than that. If they should prove booby traps, the way to escape them is look straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. Straight at him. Straight at him. And as you see Jesus, you out of the net. And you'll escape the net. So here we have a man. You have a man in the middle of life, a living man in a dead world, a good man in a bad world, a right man in a wrong world, a man of God in a suit with men of flesh. And he was living in the middle of it, and living right in the middle of it, and thanking God in the middle of it, and fruitful in it, serving his generation by the will of God. And so here was a living man, believing and praying. After all, on trust and obey, pretty near hits it. He believed and he prayed. The devil can silence you so you can't pray anymore. That's one of the first things he has to do. When an enemy comes into a country, one of the first things he wants to do is to destroy communication. He comes to your home, if he's a wise burglar, that is, wise in the ways of the devil, he cut the telephone wires before he comes in. Communication with help, the source of help, then you're an easy victim. So prayer is the source between you and help. And if the devil can cut the wires and discourage you so you don't pray, you're an easy In God's name I beseech you, begin to pray. You've had a rough time of it, maybe some of you have, and I suppose I don't even know you. you, you you've been treated rough this last week. You've gone through hard things. Well, if you fight, then I say thank God, and I wouldn't have had it otherwise. But if you're discouraged and your prayers are, are coming to you and watch out, better get your communications established. Better get to God again. You say, I can't pray. I'm blue veiled and I can't pray. Oh, you can say Abba. You can say that much, can't you? We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. And he gives forth the spirit of his son, saying, Abba, Father. And Abba, you know, one Arabic, word for father and various other languages have it, Abba. And they tell me that Abba is a word you can, can speak without teeth. You can take your teeth out and still say Abba. But if it was a difficult thing, you'd have to get your teeth. Say Abba before you have any teeth. The little fellow I see back there now, I can see through the glass, somebody holding a little chap. He can't, he can say Abba. And so we can say that if you feel so little and hopeless and useless that you can't pray, if you can't pray like a babe, pray like a newborn babe and say, Abba. And keep saying it and God will hear your prayer and know what you mean. Smith, that great English writer of several generations ago, he never knew what to do with punctuation. Never. He was a brilliant writer, stylist to perfection, but he never knew how to punctuate. So he wrote a manuscript and then he wrote one page. And on that page of punctuation marks that were in the English language. And said, note, sprinkle these around where they'll do the most good. <laughs> he didn't know where they belonged, but he hoped somebody did. And so I say to you this, just tell God, oh God, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say, but hear my heart and sprinkle it around where it won't fit where it ought to be. I'm too dumb. I don't even know how to pray, God. Ah, God loves people like that. The meek he will the meek he will teach his way. And if you will simply meekly say, Abba Father, for Jesus' sake, pretty soon you will get eloquent. And then communications are established. 